Apple recently held its latest launch event, which means it's time to bring Brian Ma, Asia's top device analyst, back onto the Tech First Asia podcast to discuss the latest products and what they mean for the device market. We'll discuss the latest iPhone 14 launch and see how the new phones compare to the flagships from Huawei and Samsung. We'll take a look at the Apple Watch Ultra, which is now targeting the competitive athlete market, and see what that means for traditional vendors like Garmin and Sunto. And we'll get Brian's thoughts about when we could expect Apple's new devices, like maybe a foldable phone or potentially a VR headset, and how soon they might come. We'll also cover off a lot more than just that, so let's get going with your annual gadget fix. Brian Ma, welcome back to the Tech Burst Asia podcast. Thanks for having me, Charles. So last week, Apple held its much-anticipated iPhone 14 launch event. And we're going to come back to the event and what was announced in a minute. But I want to ask you an honest question because I said the event was much anticipated, but was it really? I mean, I don't remember hearing much fanfare in the buildup to this launch. I think it depends on who you hang out with. If you, at least the phone enthusiasts of the world and even just broader Apple fanboys of the world, of course, they look forward to this event every year as if it's a big, well, it is a big event, right? I mean, for Apple shareholders too, it's a big revenue driver. So there was quite a bit of anticipation. And as usual, there were a lot of leaks that came out beforehand, especially in the days before and weeks before. Oh, it might have satellite communications. And, oh, strategically. It might be eSIM only. And oh, there might not be a mini anymore. Yeah, it may very well be strategically leaked. Who knows? But the point is that, at least from my perspective, this was quite an anticipated event. But yeah, I would actually say, even with the general public, friends and family were asking me, even my daughter, it was like, hey, there's a new iPhone launching soon in a couple of weeks. So there was anticipation of that, at least from my point of view. Did she also remind you that Christmas is coming up and that yeah. she wants a How new... convenient for yeah. her. Yes, exactly. Great news. Okay. So let's start out the discussion about that event and what was launched. And I want to start with the Apple Watch Ultra because obviously for the last, God knows how many years now, we've debated the value of smartwatches. Yep. And I've always stuck more with my sport watches. But now Apple with this Watch Ultra is making a play into that space for the adventure athlete. What do you think about this device? It's quite a, it's a good move for Apple. Frankly, one of the complaints about Apple Watch in the past has been that it can't compare to the Garmin's and Shunto's of the world because it's not purpose built for athletes. Sure, you could track fitness on it, but it was more of a general purpose device. We already got a hint that Apple was going in this direction at WWDC earlier this year when they were telling developers without having shown the hardware yet, they were telling developers, look, these are all the features we're building in. It's going to be built for triathletes, going to do better job at tracking your swimming and that kind of thing. And now we finally have the hardware to go along with it, with everything from that ruggedized case and the screen to the bigger battery to the dedicated button and all that sort of thing. It's a good move in addressing that concern. I think the Garmin's and Shunto's of the world have to be wondering, oh, oh okay, Apple's coming after this space even if they still have arguably the more dedicated watches for athletes, Apple's inching closer and closer, and it's got to be a concern. But this is what I've been waiting for because I've never really liked the idea of the regular Apple Watch. I wanted them to start focusing either on healthcare solutions or going after that sport fitness market because then it becomes something that I would be considering buying. But battery life is still only up to 60 hours, so I don't think I could complete a triathlon in 60 hours, so it wouldn't be able to support <laughs> me, but that's a whole separate issue. But it's... Sorry, on that point, it's actually funny. Was it Garmin? I think that did a tweet after the Apple event. They basically said, we measure our battery life in months, not in hours. Not my Garmin, I can promise you that. Trust me, whether it's the one on my bike or the one on my wrist, they don't have that long a battery life. But one thing that's interesting on this, that watch now, you're talking about a list price of 799 US dollars, which is about 1100 Sing. So that's quite a bit. That compares, that's what a, a normal smartphone cost now is. Sure. Yeah, well, there's a lot of material going into that device. I mean, to that earlier point about how it's going after that market, one of my colleagues in the office, he's quite the athlete. I'm definitely not much of an athlete, but he is. He's a triathlon athlete. And he was basically telling me even before the, in the years past, when we were talking about Apple Watch versus his Garmin, he was basically pointing out how, yeah, these Garmin's just, they're so much better than Apple Watch because of things like being able to do as what resting time and tracking his heart rate. The sensor on the Apple Watch wasn't as good in the water and things like that. And now he's already pre-ordered his Ultra. He says everyone in his triathlon team has ordered the Ultra. He's talking about how one of his friends is a runs a dive shop 
And he's scared about the, his existing stock of Shunto watches, his dive computers, basically. And he's joking that hey, maybe I should just stock Apple Watch Ultra Fit Bands, the watch strap, because that would sell quite well. I think there's quite a bit of interesting momentum here. And Apple, the typical disruptor, if you will, coming into the market. I think this is, that's why it's quite significant in my mind. I got to admit, this is the first time I would consider getting an Apple Watch, but there is a limiting factor for me. And that's that when I bought my Garmin watch, a lot of it was for hiking and I wanted the map functionality. Problem is I have really bad eyesight in my old age and I can't read the watch anymore. So it's got maps on there. I just can't read them. Even like the phone size, I have to have it blown up all the way just so I can see what time it is. So I think it's an interesting thing for people who actually have decent vision. <laughs> I'm sure there's accessibility features in there too. But what do you think? Are there going to be other components they're adding on there? Now, they've already had the basic ones like sleep tracking. Are they going to keep going down this path? Apple, I mean, are they going to keep trying, do you think, go after that segment and add an additional functionality and really differentiate? And if so, how long of a lifespan does someone like Polar or Garmin or Sunto have? Yeah, well, I think there will still always be those specialized niches for them to be in. But yeah, you're right. The trajectory here. And that's why the Garmin's and Polar's and Shunto's of the world have to be, it's got to be keeping them up at night. It's like, mm -hmm. great, this big disruptor is coming in and it's basically throwing everything off, right? Yeah, it's got to be a challenge. So one of their other big competitors in the watch space is going to be the Samsung Galaxy Watch 5 Pro. How do those two devices compare? And do you think Samsung will do a similar thing? Will they start going after the adventure athletes? They could, to some degree, they've kind of tried with the active, but again, it's not really, yeah. it's not that competitive with those specialized watches. Don't forget, arguably, Samsung's device from a feature-by-feature -feature comparison has a few advantages against the Apple Watch, for instance, being able to track blood pressure, even since the previous generation of the Samsung device. But at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter as much because this is all about ecosystems. We have to think of smartwatches not as a standalone device. It's a complement and a sticky piece of glue for your smartphone. It's an extension of your smartphone. The only people that are gonna go for the Apple Watch are Apple users, right? They're not going to consider a Samsung smartwatch and vice versa. So in that sense, I wouldn't consider them head to head as just take a step back and look at the broader ecosystem of devices. That watch is not a standalone piece. It's part of a broader collection. So are you saying that the Apple ecosystem is actually better than the Tizen ecosystem? <laughs> and I know they are like, that's, that's an easy target. Yeah, yeah. That's an easy target. They're working with Google on that, in fact. So yeah. the latest version is on Wear OS and there are Tizen elements in there, but with the Google Wear OS app ecosystem. Tizen's still alive on TVs, don't forget. And even they're building them into monitors. Yeah, Samsung put, builds them into PC monitors so that you can run Netflix natively on a monitor. And that's all powered by Tizen. Okay, so the long and short of it is on the smartwatch, you're impressed with Apple's new Watch Ultra. And if I can get my vision back, I should get one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sounds very good. All right, now let's get on to the launch of the iPhone 14. Yep. What are your thoughts on this new device? It's a good thing. They're definitely going to be driving a lot of revenue from it. It got a lot of score. Apple could launch a piece of cardboard yeah. and drive a lot of revenue from yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I think someone said that the famous saying is if they sold a toilet seat, people would buy it. But no, I think there was a lot of scorn online about saying, oh, the iPhone 14 is just like the iPhone 13. I think Steve Jobs' daughter apparently put out a meme and then deleted her Instagram post about it. Which is good because it's not like those things live on after you hit delete. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in my opinion, the scorn's a bit unwarranted. I actually think Apple did quite a bit to go above and beyond on this launch. And I'm usually the kind of guy who, with most phone launches, it is quite boring. Honestly, it is, oh, I have a bigger battery, I have a better screen, I have a better camera, whatever it is, like yawn, yawn, yawn. But with Apple this time around, what did we get? We got things like satellite communications. We got things like eSIM only models, right? They stuck their nut out there on some of these things. And granted, they don't all apply to all users and they might not make that much of a difference, but they did go further with things like the camera and the megapixel count and the low light capabilities and all that. And at the end of the day, as you pointed out, it's an Apple product. It's a new Apple product. It's going to. And so yeah. You talked about those two characteristics and I want to look at each of them, but let's start with the satellite bit. So they're going to get the connectivity through Global Star, but the idea is don't you almost have to aim it at the satellite to get it to work? Yeah, there's, it's, you have to, there's a, they built an app where you've got to wait to make sure the satellite is overhead and it may take 30 seconds or however much time in order to actually get that connection. And it's a very, very slow bit rate. So 
you're not going to be doing your TikToks off of this thing. And you can't, I don't even think you can make phone calls. It's, it's, it's a, for emergency. Yeah, right? correct. It's for emergency use. So it's a, the, the app actually has a pre-built like questionnaire to compress all the information that you need. Like my location is here, whatever, you need medical help and that sort of thing. Then it gets it out there and it may take a good number of minutes to send as well. Minutes. And this is not your typical data connection. But nonetheless, when you're in a pinch, when you're in one of these situations, it's still good to have. Except you need the connectivity to look up the instructions on how to actually send the message. It's built into the app. And of course, as okay. Apple designs things to be very consumer friendly, okay, it should be easy to use. So I did look into some stats on this. And in the US, users spend roughly 1% of their time disconnected from cellular. Sure. And a lot of those people will be athletes who tend to go out, but they might be just hiking or something in the middle of nowhere. So I do think it's interesting. I'm just not sure if it's a really game changer, but I'm interesting to see how they evolve this in the future. Yeah, exactly. Especially with, coincidentally enough, all these other satellite services like from Elon Musk that suddenly appeared the week before Apple did their announcement. Huawei did their device that says, oh, we'll also do satellite yeah. communication. And they get it out before Apple did. Yeah. But unfortunately, now like Huawei gets no press anymore because of the whole situation. And it's a China-only yeah. system. But yeah, so... You're right that the Apple Emergency SOS service is, it's not like it's going to be a commonly used feature and hopefully not. Hopefully you're not in one of those situations when you're in an emergency and you need it. But it is quite interesting because it is there. It could open up the door in the future. Qualcomm has been working on part of their 5G narrative now. And now that it's built into the 5G standard is around satellite communications. And like we just discussed, you've got more and more providers that are coming on board, including T-Mobile working with SpaceX and Starlink to get all this connectivity happening there. So it'd be interesting to see where this goes ahead in the future, even if for now it's very much a niche functionality. And I think it is the initial foray, but there is plans for this because obviously if you can start leveraging satellite connectivity, eliminates the cost of having to roll out base stations. And depending on the areas you're going to, you can provide connectivity to a rural region at a relatively lower cost than actually rolling out the hardware. Yeah, I would argue it's augmenting rather than replacing. Yeah. yeah. Now, eSIMs, I do like the idea of the eSIMs, and I am very curious how this one's going to play out. Yeah. So basically, they're saying with those phones, there's going to be no physical SIM slot anymore. In the U.S.? In the U.S., yeah. yeah. Outside of the U.S., they still will. Well, that's for now. I can imagine what's going to happen next. Yeah. So why would they do this? Now, I heard some people saying it's basically to give a little bit more space to put a battery in. Do you have any yeah. insights on that? Yeah. It's physical real estate in that small PCB in the case that you have. Mm -hmm. That little bit of physical space that was taken up, not just by the SIM card itself, but the door and that whole slot, but yeah. it could be used for other things, including potentially a larger battery or some other component, some discrete chip that you might need to put in there. And so it is about real estate. But what I always liked about eSIMs is what it actually enables because it makes it very easy to switch carriers and go onto a better data plan. Sure. For that same reason, Mobile operators have never really been too helpful to allow people to use eSIMs because they want to control the customer and they want to have high switching costs. So T-Mobile was the one that announced eSIM support on the back of this, I believe, yeah. which is a great thing for them because this literally makes it very easy for people to switch over. Do you think other operators are going to finally jump into this space or are they still going to sit there and try and dig their heels in and hold on to their existing revenue streams. Yeah, the ones digging their heels in are the incumbents. They have the yeah. most to lose. And of course, the ones that are cheering this are the smaller operators who have the most to gain from the churn. The thing I really like about this is the sheer weight of Apple pushing this through. The incumbents basically have to get on board because they need to carry Apple phones. Their users want Apple phones, so they have to get on board with this. And so that's why this is quite significant from an industry perspective, because it's that much needed kick that the industry needed in order to really move in the direction that, frankly, all the device vendors have wanted to go in anyway. Like we said, it, it, from a design perspective, it's much better. In addition to like the waterproofing capabilities and all that, you no, no longer have a door anymore in there. So device vendors have wanted to go this way for a while. It's the telcos that are putting their foot down. And hopefully now this gets the industry moving. Again, US only for now, but hopefully we'll start to see that change in other geos. And I think the reason that Apple can do it is just because their brand is so strong and people will buy devices direct. Totally. And, and it's not like they care about Verizon in the U.S. or when it's <laughs> AT&T. They want the Apple phone and it can be on whatever network. So this is going to be interesting to see how it plays out in the U.S. Yeah. Do you think we'll start seeing eSIM only phones coming into other regions or will governments block it to try and protect their incumbents? Yeah, it'll depend on the geo, right? And in fact, if anything, China is the one where even in the previous generation of iPhones, they did not have an eSIM. Right now, they're dual SIM. Most phones around the world, they're one physical, one eSIM. In China, they're both physical SIMs because in China, they're the telcos 
basically don't have eSIM available. So I think in other parts of the world, whether it's Western Europe, in certain parts of Asia, whatever it might be, yes, we'll eventually start to move in that direction where it does go eSIM only, probably in a couple generations from now. Um, China being the holdout will be the interesting one to watch. Well, I think we're going to start hearing a lot of crying come from a lot of operators soon because that eliminates a lot of their strength and control over their customers. But also, like we mentioned, right before the Apple launch last week, Huawei did launch its Mate 50, which we said also a satellite. So any thoughts on this type of a device? Is this just going to be China only now? And is it really separated into there's China and the rest of the world? Yeah. And that line was already drawn when Huawei lost its Google app support. Mm -hmm. So granted, Huawei technically does sell their non-Google phones in overseas markets, but Naturally, they don't appeal as well to consumers. So they really don't sell that well there. It's really just Huawei keeping its foot in the door, if you will. So where they have been getting momentum or where they still sell most of their phones is in China. But even in China, they're crippled because they don't have access to 5G chipsets. So these devices, including that flagship that they just launched, is actually 4G only. Qualcomm had to modify its SoC to make the radios 4G only. And Accordingly so, in China, even if Huawei is the homegrown hero that folks are rooting for, it still is just a 4G phone, unfortunately. And that's why Apple has actually been, been gaining a lot of share in China, because if you look at the premium segment of the market in China, it's basically just Apple now. In the absence of Huawei, which used to be in that premium segment, it's basically Apple that's cleaning up share and getting a lot of share. Even the other local vendors like Xiaomi, Oppo, and Vivo, they've tried to put high-end phones in there, but they haven't been as successful. Apple still has that cachet and that draw. And what about Samsung? We don't really see Samsung in China, never have. Yeah, they tumbled, unfortunately, several years ago, especially with the rise of Xiaomi, yeah. Oppo, and Vivo. So Samsung's presence in China is minimal. However, they actually do decently well on their foldables in China. That's one of the few things that does distinguish them. But the problem is in China, you've also got all these local Chinese vendors doing foldable phones, including Xiaomi, Oppo, Vivo, and these other guys. They're up against those guys. So what's interesting is, so I'm digressing here, but if we were to talk about foldables, if you look at the foldable phone market globally, eight or nine out of every 10 foldable phones sold globally come from Samsung. In China, the leader is not Samsung, it's Huawei. Huawei has, I think, 60, 70% share, and you've got all those other guys that I mentioned. Samsung comes in number three in the foldable space in, in China. I got to admit, I do the foldable phones, largely because as my eyes get worse, I like a bigger screen. When is Apple going to come up with their foldable? Because we talked about it this about a year ago in the podcast. I think the last two podcasts we've talked about this. Still not anywhere close. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't expect it to change in the sense that they want to make sure that everything is ready, not just in terms of the hardware and the durability, and, and but also the usage model for the consumer. I'm sure they're testing it. I'm sure they'd love to get into it. There's not only would the products probably aren't ready, but also... A couple other things to consider. Is the supply chain ready for one? Because if Apple sells units, they're going to sell a lot of those units. And even the foldable screen production might not be able to catch up with all that. So part of it could also be a function of supply. Another thing to keep in mind too is maybe Apple is approaching this from a different perspective rather than thinking about it as a foldable phone. Could it be more of a foldable tablet, a foldable iPad? That would be interesting. Yeah. Think of it, so there could be a different way that they're going about it rather than going head-to-head -head with Samsung. Well, hopefully it comes out next year because then I can stop asking you about this and every time we do a podcast. <laughs> but you did mention the Samsung phones. You didn't cover off on the S22. S22 basically competes more against the iPhone. How is that device doing right now compared to the iPhone in spec functionality? It's do Well, I'll tell you from a business perspective, they're doing quite well with it. You, you listen to what Samsung's been talking about on their earnings calls. They've been, they've been doing quite well due to the premium product line. It's actually the lower end phones. If you look at the total market, the market's kind of suffering. And that's mainly because of the low end phones. Whereas Samsung was still able to get good results and profitability thanks to these premium products. Now, from a product perspective, you compare the products against each other. You could argue that Samsung has a better zoom lens, for instance, doing 100 times zoom on that camera. Whatever other features, but this has always been that. Android versus iPhone comparison. Android will usually outspec things. Android will usually have features that the iPhone doesn't. But Apple users are still drawn to Apple. And arguably, they're more consumer-friendly and more usable on the Apple side, too. 
Okay, very good. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. Let's say that I give you a choice of three devices right now. The new iPhone 14, okay. I'll give you the S22 or the Samsung Flip, and you can take one of them home with you. Which would you take? It would actually be the last one, and that's only because I have a personal preference for small phones. Since you said Samsung Flip, Z Flip, not Z Fold. So we're talking about the small clamshell device, not yeah. the large fold. I use a I use an iPhone 13 mini right now. I like small screens. And so my, a few years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other actually interestingly, the other since we're talking about small devices, the other one that I'm actually eyeing is the Asus Zenfone 9. Because one of the things they did, again, they, they went where the competitors aren't. And that's basically small screen devices. There aren't many small screen devices left anymore. But again, that's just personal preference. At the end of the day, the S22 Ultra, Awesome camera. The the iPhone 14, great product as well, but it's just personal preference. I like small devices. Okay. Now let's take a step back because we've been talking about the devices, but let's just talk about the industry. And what I found interesting was I probably saw more negative press after the Apple launch, whether it's warranted or not, than I've seen after an event like that before. And it was quite shocking. And what I'm wondering is, is it harder and harder to impress people with the new functionality on these devices? And if so, what does it mean for the device manufacturers? I'd say there's some truth to that. In many ways, this market is so mature. Every phone is a rectangular block, or at least most of them outside of the folds. And with a bunch of icons and great camera and all that sort of thing. So it is getting harder to impress. I'd agree with you on that. But I also think that some of the scorn that you've seen online... It's just haters going to hate, right? Everybody mm. wants to be a critic and it's kind of fun or entertaining to watch someone tear something to shreds, but I don't think all of it's justified. I, I think these devices have done a tremendous job in terms of getting to where we are now in terms of battery life, in terms of camera performance, and in terms of the display and everything that's going on there. At the end of the day, these devices are still essential devices that consumers need and they do need to upgrade after a number of years. So even if on paper, it might not look that impressive, it might look similar to the previous product, people are still going to buy these. They still generate money. I'm not surprised because I know I still upgrade every chance I get, yeah, exactly. whether I need it or not. Let's take a look at a couple of markets, and I want to look at the bigger markets to see what the trends are. You mentioned already that China is struggling a bit with Huawei. What else is going on in the China market? Are we seeing weakening demand right now, or is it still thriving without the 5G? Yeah, it's weakened a lot particularly because of the lockdowns. So the lockdowns this year, even before that, the China market was already quite weak. There was just a general lack of consumer interest in getting new devices. And so for the past year or two, they've already been suffering. Then fast forward to 2022, Shenzhen locks down, right? Then Shanghai locks down. And even if you're not living in one of those cities in China, just the entire nationwide sentiment has just been so gloomy. Chengdu went into lockdown as well. That's 25 yeah, oh, million people. Multiple too. cities. Yeah, exactly. And it's, we still see more of that, as you pointed out. And Chengdu's gone through a lot of issues between the drought and the heat wave and the lockdown. Gosh, they got hit with several things. So yeah, the China market has been down quite significantly, such that this year, we're expecting the market there to drop below 300 million units this year, which is the lowest that the market's been since 2012. So what was the highest it's been? In the 400 something. Okay, so you're looking at it basically it's dropped a third or a quarter. Yeah, it's dropped a lot, yeah. This year we're looking at, I think it was negative 13 percentish kind of contractions. Yeah. Okay, and one of the other large markets, India, different style market than when you're going to get in China. How is that market progressing? Yeah, so that's a market that, in fact, all the Chinese vendors are looking towards is that big growth engine in the market, granted at a much lower price point, but this is a market that's been doing quite well. Now, the problem is there's been a, he a lot of headwinds for these Chinese vendors in that market. For instance, Xiaomi and Oppo and Vivo have been under scrutiny from the Indian government on various financial or legal matters like, oh, you're this remittances that you're sending back to China or, oh, you're not paying your taxes properly or whatever it is. There's scorn there from that. There's also been rumors. I think Bloomberg had reported that the Indian government was contemplating a ban on sub 12,000 rupee phones, about 150 US dollar phones and lower, basically saying Chinese vendors, you can't participate in this space. And don't forget in India, this is half of the market in India, right? This market, the price points are much, much lower than most parts of the world. And, and the players that play in the space are the Chinese vendors plus Samsung, right? But they're basically Xiaomi, Oppo, Vivo, and these other guys. So if this thing were to come through, 
they would be negatively impacted by this. However, too many repercussions if this were to come through. If you think about the local retailers in India, the manufacturing jobs in India, the challenges of getting local vendors to make up for that, for those Chinese vendors in that space, it'd be too difficult for that ban to really come in place. It would actually create a lot more problems than anything. Um, it's more likely that the Indian government is using this as leverage to address the earlier point. All of this is leverage to basically push these Chinese vendors to invest more locally. And maybe it means paying taxes. Maybe it means building more phones locally. And ultimately, I think that will be the end game. That's the way it's going to pan out, where it's just more about getting the Chinese vendors invest more in the country, help the local economy, as any government wants, right, mm. to build that local economy and that skill set. Well, the challenge is going to be in India. I think the rupee is at an all-time low against the U.S. dollar or bordering on it. How can they actually go out and afford something like an iPhone anymore? So they're going to need those cheaper phones. Yeah, well, there's always going to be that upper segment of the population that does go for iPhones. In fact, that's the way it is today, right? It's generally the wealthier that are going for those devices because the average selling price of these devices is way too low. Apple doesn't have a big amount of share in India precisely because they're more of that premium product. Okay, so last year, we actually talked quite a bit about the chipset situation. Can I, can I say that? Chipset situation. Thank you. What's going on with that now? Are we still seeing shortages in the supply chain? That's actually quite the opposite. We've gone from a severely supply-constrained environment, particularly for low-end 4G chipsets, that's flipped around to a very demand-constrained environment. Earlier, we were talking about how much this market has collapsed or at least significantly fallen because of the lack of demand. So on the supply side, we actually have the opposite situation. We have oversupply with many components now, particularly things like displays. Prices are falling on those, on driver ICs for those displays, on various other components that are all coming down. The 4G chipset shortage I talked about previously isn't as bad of an issue anymore. And arguably on the 5G chipset side, there's actually more then the OEMs can digest where many of these Chinese vendors, they have so much of that 5G supply, they're trying to get rid of that inventory right now. So they can do that before 6G comes around. Yeah, exactly. All right. So let's look out to the future. How do you see the market for smartphones or smartwatches evolving? Because it seems like it's harder and harder to differentiate. What is the future going to hold? Harder to differentiate for, well, so I think for smartphones, as, as much as the industry has matured, like we talked about earlier, and you're right that it is harder to differentiate, the reality is that there is still differentiation. Whether it's Samsung rolling out its foldables, whether it's Apple pulling out these rabbit out of its hat, like the satellite communications and that sort of thing, there is still a lot of momentum going on there. But I agree with you in the grand scheme of things, yeah. Innovation probably has slowed down. We are looking at these monolithic blocks. I think there is more room to grow for smart watches, precisely because, of course, if that's less of a mature market. There's still a lot of ways to go in terms of battery life, in terms of apps, in terms of usage models that there's, we're probably still going to see quite a bit of interesting stuff there. Okay, Brian, so you cover a lot more than just smartphones and smartwatches and wearables, which is what we've been talking about primarily today. Is there anything else that you're looking at that you think is quite interesting that we should be aware of in the device hardware market? Yeah, I would draw your attention to PCs and maybe AR and VR. In the case of PCs, this is a market that has benefited tremendously from the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, this market was shipping about 270 million units a year. In the pandemic, you were shipping about 350 million units a year with everybody working from home and studying from home. And a lot of those being Chromebooks, by the way, too. And then suddenly this year, we're expecting the market to come in at 305 million units. So definitely not as high as it was in the pandemic, but not down to pre-pandemic levels either. The industry and the PC industry is similar to what we just discussed with smartphones on the oversupply. We have a similar situation on the PC side, right? A lot of the PC vendors trying to clear their inventory. As our teams have been out in the field, what are they finding? They're finding retail channels stuffed with inventory and they can't take anymore because they've got too many PCs. I think the demand, long-term perspective, the demand is still there, right? At the end of the day, this whole hybrid workforce model and even remote learning and that sort of thing, there are still going to be situations where, you know, those pandemic habits still stuck. Some of them were more comfortable now working and studying remotely than we were pre-pandemic, even if we are going back to the office a few days a week or back to school or whatever it might be. So 
there will still be that post-pandemic demand that's there that should keep the market above the pre-pandemic levels. But yeah, it's certainly not at those pandemic level peaks. And since we talked about innovation, there's still some interesting stuff that we saw in the past few months coming out of the PC market, more foldable notebooks, right? Gigantic 17 inch screens that can fold down to a 12 or 13 inch screen for more portability. But you get the utility of a gigantic 17 inch screen. I'll never forget this. I was at an event, it must've been eight years ago, and somebody walked in with a gigantic tablet and they were trying to explain to me that this was the future of tablets. And I'm not kidding you, it was, it's the size of a television. And the person put it down on the table and started taking notes on it. And I was just thinking, no, this is not the future. Yeah. It, I'll agree that even these devices that rolled out, right? Lenovo and Asus have basically been the ones that have rolled them out. They admittedly look quite chunky, especially when you fold it in half. I think that technology will improve over time. Right now, you're right. It does look pretty. For certain usage models, and this is where that analyst in me is quite excited at the thought of being able to see this gigantic spreadsheet on a 17-inch screen, and I could still in my PowerPoint slides and see my tweet deck and all, all that coming down and all that real estate. So you're right. Right now, it's definitely a niche. And these are outrageously expensive prices products, by the way, are like two, $3,000 and upwards. So this is definitely not a mainstream product right now, but I think so basically like the cost of a low-end Apple product. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's doing quite well with their Apple Silicon, by the way. But yeah, I think, I think those are things to watch out for on the PC side. Now, AR and VR was the other one that I was talking about. Of course, this is a market that has been struggling over many years, trying to find that use case. So far, it's largely been gaming and watching videos and that sort of thing. Pokemon. <laughs> Well, okay, but that's on a, that's on a phone yep. you know, or a tablet. I'm talking about the headsets, right? So the headset market itself, dominated by Oculus right now or Facebook slash Meta, right? It's like 80 or 90% share for them globally. So they dominate this market. I think what gets interesting and the reason why I bring this up, despite how small this market is compared to the rest of them, right? This, we're talking about a 10, 50 million units a year market compared to the 1.3 billion units a year market that the smartphone market is, right? So this it's clearly a much smaller market, but the reason why I bring this up as an interesting thing 2023 will get quite interesting in terms of the number of products that come into the market. Not only are we expecting Facebook to roll out some of its next generation products. In fact, one of the higher end products just got leaked. Somebody left the device in a hotel room. <laughs> it's a common story in the technology industry. Wasn't it an iPhone that got left in a bar and then some other device, I think it was a Pixel that got left in a restaurant or something like that. So somebody left this Oculus headset at a hotel room. So that one got leaked out and Oculus is planning to, sorry, I should say Meta. Meta is planning to launch this at their annual developer conference in October. So we should get the official details on that soon. But more importantly, beyond the Facebook products, the two big elephants in the room, one of which is probably pretty obvious, Apple, right? There's been a lot of rumors around what Apple may or may not be shipping. Rumors have generally suggested we're looking at towards the tail end of this year, more likely pushing into first or second quarter of next year. And of course, whatever Apple does is going to be quite, there's a lot of momentum that moves behind Apple and the whole ecosystem there. So that's one to watch, even though the rumors are likely that's going to be quite high priced and probably not going to ship in high volumes as a result. But the other one, the third one that a lot of people tend to forget in the VR space that actually is going to do quite well is Sony with the PlayStation VR 2, PS VR 2. They already did quite well with the original PS VR. Of course, in that case, they're riding off the coattails of the PlayStation, right? So it's a console, it's going after those console gamers. They've done quite a bit of hardware improvements to PS VR 2. And of course, they have the titles, the gaming titles to go with it. So 2023 will probably become one of those years where you look back and say, yeah, there was, that's where you see one of those little inflection points in the industry where we got beyond that niche 10 to 15 million units a year, a magnitude to one that becomes bigger. And again, we're still far from this becoming, from this replacing smartphones, right? I think Zuckerberg's vision of the metaverse and how this takes over our, our work and personal lives, that's still five, 10 years away, if that. We're definitely not there yet. But 20, 2023 will be, I think, an interesting one to watch, given everything that is likely to happen between Sony, Facebook, and Apple. But is that going to be primarily in gaming? 
Probably yes, because so far gaming is that killer, if even killer is the right word to use, because not everybody's into gaming, right? Yeah. Not, not every single, but he's going to buy one of these things. Some of it not is because- But he can afford them. These headsets are still quite expensive. They can be, but the nice thing and the reason why Facebook was able to get 80% share of the market last year is because they were able to price that $299, which is the price of a console. It's actually, it's a decent, and it's a gift. It's a good Christmas gift. So not all of them are that expensive. Granted, Facebook had to raise the price by a hundred bucks recently. And like a, to your point, the Apple product is probably going to be four digit kind of yep. figure. So that's obviously not as much of an impulse buy and a gifting product. Is there anything they make that's under that price point except an ear tag? <laughs> yeah, that's true. AirPods. How about AirPods. that? Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, I don't use those, but. Oh, and the socks that they had for the iPods, if you remember those. Oh, it's just. Way back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so I do get excited about AR VR, but I'm still waiting for the ecosystem developed, because right now it is gaming. I do think there's incredible possibilities in healthcare in ways that you can use it for training for frontline workers. We're just waiting for the ecosystem developing. Like you mentioned with the metaverse, we don't have the people who know how to design or develop for the metaverse yet. I thought you were going to tell me that Zuckerberg accidentally left it in the metaverse and someone found it there. But that, I guess that's a leak for the future. Right now, it's just pictures of him and his hoverboard carrying the American flag. <laughs> anyway, so we've covered a lot on devices today, Brian. So I want to say thank you very much for your time. Any final thoughts on the market? Hopefully, the this looming recession everyone's worried about doesn't suppress demand too much. If we're talking about a short-lived recession, we should expect to see many of these markets moving back to slightly positive growth rates again. Granted, at the end of the day, they're relatively flat given how mature most of these markets are. But you look to these other newer growth areas, whether it's in wearables and AR, VR, and there could be some interesting stuff happening. Well, that's good because it's been a tough couple of years. So it's yeah. good to see us coming out of it a little bit and hopefully driving growth again and getting some great new phones that have some interesting functionality so we can talk about it again next time. Sure. All right, Brian, thanks again for coming on the Tech First Asia podcast. Thanks for having me, Charles. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Tech Burst Asia podcast. If you liked the episode, please do click like and subscribe. And if you didn't, well, you probably didn't make it this far anyway. Talk to you next time on the next episode of the Tech Burst Asia podcast.